top 20 saddest moments in kid shows. I'm very hesitant to find out what this is going to be, bro. Because uh, the last time we looked at disturbing, like, lost cartoons, bro, they were psychotic, bro. Like, it's, uh, they, were, they were trying to put subliminal messages into my brain and hypnotize me. And then fill me with propaganda, dude. They were trying to induce nightmares upon me for a week, bro. So, I'm not... I'm not too comfortable with what we're about to witness, bro. I, my, my heart might break. Let's see what we got. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hey, man. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I miss you. Oh. Bye. Okay. As children grow up, they're absorbent to everything exposed to them. This is the age where they're molded and developed into the person they're going to be. As such, they deserve the best media television has to offer. But when a character becomes so real that children can start to relate and feel with them, it's powerful. So today, I'm going to count down the saddest moments in kid shows. Before there's a damn war zone in the comments, spoilers, these moments may not be sad now as we get older, but they definitely were when we were kids. And that's kind of the point. And some moments will mean more to me if it's from a show I grew up with. Uncontrollable child. Anyways, okay. this is the top That's 20 fair. saddest moments in kid shows. That's fair. But on the contrary, you might also see a grown man cry today. So you never know, bro. What is that? Is it? Is that kids next door? Number 20. Married Melodies. So we're not going to talk about that. This is a classic. Mark the bulldog befriends and takes care of a small kitten. Throughout the episode, he tries to hide the small cat from his owner so that she won't get kicked out. Now I have seen everything. But she eventually ends up in an electric mixer to be made into cookies. Then she is made into morbidly animal shaped cookies. What? It gets even more depressing when Mark places the cookie on his back. Just like how the small kitten oh used to. Oh my god! <laughs> but we learned that she actually got out of the mixer when Mark was thrown out of the house. Oh and my! And she's safe. Dude, oh my god, bro. The crazy thing is, is I've never seen this. I ain't never heard of this cartoon a day in my life, bro, and I was heartbroken just hearing that. Yeah, he befriends a cat and loves the cat, and the cat just gets slaughtered in a batch of cookies. That's nice, man, and now I'm sad, and I ain't never seen Thank this. Thank God, because before that, the ending was just tear-jerking. Nice, bro, I probably would've been crying too. The world of David the Gnome, the ending. I don't know what that is either. In the series finale, David and his wife Lisa must travel to the mountains of beyond. This is because gnomes only live to be 400 years old, and they will soon be approaching that age. They all share a cheer about their mandatory death with their friend Casper, who also will be passing soon. Don't cry, my friend. Don't cry. After we've gone, you'll find some new friends, I'm sure of it. Through thick snow and heavy winds, they all say their farewells to each other and prepare for the afterlife. Farewell, my dear David, my husband, my love. Farewell, my beloved. I thank you for all the love you've given me. But see, that's a wholesome ending, man. They turn into beautiful trees. Beautiful nature, providing Number oxygen. 18. Cat Dog, The Great Parents Mystery. Cat In this three-part special, Cat Dog are on a quest to find their parents. They meet aliens, fish monsters, and even a village of cats and dogs who live happily together in peace. Alas, they're still unable to reunite with their parents. That is until they literally run into this creature. That's right, they're cat dog's parents. Wait, what? Not their biological ones, <laughs> but they raised them, fed them, loved them, and made them who they are today. Why have I never 
never seen this. This is the first, the first time I've seen this, bro. I loved Cat Dog. I used to love Cat Dog. I ain't never seen this. We learned that they were tragically separated from each other due to a tornado erupting from the ground. Damn, dude. Fortunately, they do reunite. But that sucks how they were separated. And we still don't know who their parents really are. That one wasn't too bad because that had a good ending. They, they came back. Number 17. They reunited. American Dragon Jake Long. Homecoming. Classic, bro. Classic. Ah, this show was awesome. Absolutely. Yes, the art style changed mid-series because of a new director. Made no fucking sense, And I'm one of the yeah. few that actually prefers the new, sharper style. I don't know. It just reminds me of Spectacular Spider-Man. But the show still kicked ass. And what was supposed to be the series finale, this episode had Jake and Rose nominated as Homecoming King and Queen. But when the Huntsmen managed to capture the last Aztec skull, they tried to use it to wish away all mythical creatures, including Jake. Instead, Rose knocks the Huntsmen out at the last moment, calling for the destruction of all Huntsmen instead including herself. Jake then grabs the main skull, wishing for Rose to have never been taken by the Hunt clan. The next day, Jake reunites with Rose. The wish came true. But since she was never taken at birth, she led a completely different life and doesn't even know Jake. So, I guess I'll see you around. Actually, you won't. My dad got a job overseas. We're leaving for Hong Kong first thing tomorrow. Well, it was nice talking to you. Damn, bro, he was a in there too, bro. He was, he was, he was about to clap him some white girl cheeks, bro. He was, he was ready. He was, he was ready to go fucking crazy, bro. And in, in order to save her life, she don't even know who he is no more, man. That's, that must be hard. That, that must be hard, bro. He finally, finally finds a woman that loves him and he, he can't even love her. That's fucked, bro. Let's keep your head up, King. You too, Rose. Happy homecoming. Number 16, The Wren and Stimpy Show, Son of Stimpy. Oh, calling this a kid's show is hard, but it was on daytime Nickelodeon, so it counts. John Kay, the creator of the show, stated that if he made more heartwarming stories, Nickelodeon would let him do more gross stories. In this episode, Stimpy gives birth to a fart who gets lost. And that's it. The rest of the episode is just about Stimpy being a distraught mother trying to find her baby. Now, the episode Damn. still has its familiar imagery and animation, but it's way sadder than usual. Why am I not surprised Ren and Stimpy made a Number sad 15, episode about a fart? The Adventures of Batman and Robin, Baby Doll. This show has tons of emotional moments, focusing hard on giving all the villains an actual backstory and some character. But the one gem that everyone looks over is Baby Doll, a woman with a weird condition that prevents her from looking older. She used to be a hit star on a television show before being upstaged and leaving. Now she can't find any work, so she tries to capture her old cast members to recreate her once hit show. It's a little silly, but you really do feel bad for Baby Doll. And no, it's the third act that villain. really gets to you how she's essentially running away from the reality that Batman represents and even forced to confront herself. That's not too bad. She's, she's just 14, dealing with issues. She's got issues. Adventure Time. I Remember You. Adventure Time. Wow, what a bright, simplistic, and colorful show. Surely there isn't anything sad in this series. Oh, I've talked about the episode I Remember You before, but let's do this. Ice King, without a doubt, is one of the most tragic characters in the show, and this episode explores his relationship with Marceline, the Vampire Queen. We learn that the Ice King, or Simon as he used to be called, took care of a young Marceline during the events of the war. But since then, Simon has now been reduced to a crazy, pathetic old man who has been suffering from insanity to the point where he doesn't even remember Marceline. She was desperate to make her only childhood friend and father figure remember her. 
Number 13. Damn, okay. Justice League Unlimited, For the Man Who Has Everything. Based on the comic of the same name, Batman and Wonder Woman travel to the Fortress of Solitude to visit Superman on his birthday. They discover an alien-looking parasite on Superman's chest, causing him to hallucinate. While Batman tries to remove Suck it, it and Wonder Woman fights Mongol, Superman is trapped in a dream where his home planet Krypton was never destroyed and he lives with a lady named Loanna and their son Vanel. But Superman has this repeated crypto! feeling that something isn't it's right. Crypto! <laughs> it dawns on him that, yeah, Krypton did explode when he was a child and he really lives on Earth. As his utopian life begins to fade away, he has to tell his son that this isn't real. He isn't real. Damn, bro. Bro, this reminds me of the Avengers. Y'all remember in the Avengers, right? It's, uh, when they first met, um, when they first met Scarlet Witch, right? And she did the thingy where she like took over their minds. And Steve Rogers was back in nineteen like twenty three, and he was he was slow dancing with Peggy and stuff. Yeah, bro, that's what this reminds me of, dude. Number 12. That's sad as fuck, though. Like, you, you sleep and you're in a deep sleep and you're in this utopian society. You're dreaming your love and life, bro. Everything is absolutely perfect until you eventually realize, oh, fuck, none of this is real. This is all fake. You're all actually dead or none of you actually ever existed and my life is sad and miserable. That's, 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 that's fuck, Alvin dude. Alvin and the Chipmunks. Cookie Chomper the Third. Alvin and the Chipmunks. In this episode... The chipmunks find a stray cat and name her Cookie Chomper the Third. The boys try their hardest to keep their pet a secret, but eventually Dave finds out. Dave agrees to keep Cookie despite his allergies and even buys her a collar and a tag. Soon after, Cookie Chomper the Third sneaks out and gets hit by a car and killed. Oh. And even Simon is moping. They all blame each other, but Dave ensures them that it's yeah, no one's bro. fault. And soon. Bro. Number 11. And then, and then the very next day, they all got the craziest neck from the mother three chipmunks. Y'all watch Brandon if you answer. Nah, we haven't watched that yet. We haven't watched it yet. Nah. Steven Universe. Jesus Christ, can this show be depressing at times? Those bright colors and quirky characters are misleading. In the episode On the Run, we learn that Amethyst is a byproduct of whatever horrible event that the Homeworld Gems were trying to accomplish. <laughs> She's fine, but damn. How you gonna make a bubble? Number 11. Gems were trying Did to- Did you see that? How you gonna make a bubble her around and you and her even began to fight because her. of how bad she feels. Steven tries to break up the fight before an old gem machine smashes onto Amethyst. She's standing right fucking- She's standing right fucking next to you. You can, you can, you can put a force field around you, but not her, Steven, you selfish Amethyst, bastard. Amethyst, Amethyst. Steven, I cannot forgive you for this. She's fine, but damn. But the episode I keep hearing about is Rose's scabbard as one of the big emotional highlights of the series. After finding the scabbard that used to belong to Rose, Pearl begins to go off about how the That's two of them battled alongside each other a and that Rose pen. held many secrets from people, but not Pearl. The two obviously had a really close connection. As it turns out, everyone already knows about Rose's supposed secrets making Pearl feel less special and in denial. Rose kept many things secret, even from us. But not from me! I was the one she told everything! She lashes out at the group, claiming that Rose never kept any secrets from her. She probably just wanted to protect you like everyone else. What do you know? You've never even met her! We learn in a Damn, very harmonious bro. scene that Pearl and Rose had a very deep relationship and that she misses her greatly. Bro, I feel like some of these, some of these aren't hitting me as hard as they're probably supposed to just because I haven't seen them. Like, I didn't, I wasn't a Steven Universe type of guy. I, like, Steven Universe was after my time watching Cartoon Network and stuff. So I feel like if I actually watched this and understood the context of what was going on, probably would be crying my eyes out like a little bitch, you know what I mean? But I don't know, man, it's just not hitting. I feel like because I can't, I can't really... You know what I'm saying? I never really watched it. I never, I really, never really connected with this show, so I never really. It's not like it's not. You know what I'm saying? Filling me with sadness. Number ten. Fuck Pearl Pokemon. for that, Rose with Steven. Exactly. That's kind of fucked up. 
That's that's kind of fucked up, bro. Like you, your 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 parent dies before you're born or when you're a little baby, and she's like, oh, you how would you know, Steven? You ain't even met your mom because she dead, you dumbass. Yeah, that's fucked up, bro. That's that's that's, that's nice, man. Number ten, Pokemon. I really can't decide which episode is sadder, so I'll do both. Oh my god, bro. This needs no explanation. The first time, the the first time I ever, ever, ever in my life cried during a movie was the Pokemon Forever movie when Ash turned to stone and Pikachu started crying and all the other Pokemon started crying. I was sitting there in my fucking tidy whities I'm, I'm butt naked with nothing but tidy whities I got a Capri Sun and I'm just I'm bawling my eyes out, bro. Snot dripping down my face. First time I ever cried from a movie was that Pokemon Forever movie, bro. Oh my gosh. In the episode oh Bye Bye my Butterfree, gosh. our heroes are on their way towards Saffron City when Ash notices a group of Butterfreeze. Brock says that it's their mating season and all the Butterfreeze are laying their eggs all over the sea. Ash and all the other trainers send their Butterfrees so that they could find their mates. That's Butterfree's courtship dance. Courtship dance? It's Butterfree's way of saying, I want to be your Butterfree. But it looks like Ash's Pokemon is getting the cold slap of rejection and runs away. Damn. Suddenly, Team Rocket comes along and starts stealing all the Butterfrees, including this Ash. pink one that Ash's Butterfree liked. Fucking to, of course, After it's Team Rocket. Adventure, the team manages to save all the Pokemon, and Ash's Butterfree impresses his lady friend. At the end of the episode, Butterfree has oh, to leave Ash to be with his lady. Love. They even show a flashback. What's saddest is that Butterfree never came back. Like all of Ash's older Pokemon returned in future episodes, but not Butterfree. That's There's sad, also Pikachu's bro. goodbye. When Pikachu finds a clan of wild Pikachus, he befriends them and even saves one of them. Brock mentions that it must be the best thing in the world for Pikachu to be with his own kind. Team Rocket shows up to rob all the Pikachus, but of course they're inevitably stopped. After celebrating, Ash realizes that what Brock said might be true and decides that it's best to leave Pikachu with his kind. This time Pikachu does stay with Ash and the two reunite for more seasons to come. But for Ash to lose his second ever Pokemon, right before almost losing his first, must have torn kids up everywhere. Yeah, bro. And then, and yeah, him and Pikachu squatted back up and he got fucking cooked every single time he joined the Pokemon League. And he just won it like this past fucking year, but Ash was dog shit. He's getting all these trainer badges, catching all these Pokemon just to get fucking, just to get dropped in the Pokemon League, bro. He ain't went to like just this past... Number this nine. is past time, bro. Spongebob, have you seen this snail? Oh my Yes, there was also God. another set. Oh, when Gary... Oh, nah, dude. Nah, bro, I remember this. <laughs> nah, bro, when Gary's... Nah, dude. The episode where Gary left Spongebob for Patrick. Oh. But this one is also very heart-wrenching. So, Spongebob forgets to feed Gary for 10 days, causing him to run away oh. and get lost. Now it's up for a saddened Spongebob and Patrick to find Gary. Oh. It always sucks to see this someone- This is the saddest thing, bro, when the, when the, when the Gary Come Home song is playing, bro. Oh, oh, I feel it in my soul, in my heart every time, bro. This, this is, yeah. Find Spongebob so depressed and forlorn. Oh, yeah, and dude. he's like that for almost the entire episode. Even the posters and signs are heartbreaking. And then, there's the song. You all know what song I'm talking about. <laughs> Gary, now I know. I was wrong. I messed so up. And now you're gone. <laughs> Gary! And then there's the homicidal fucking psychotic cannibal fish grandma sitting there fattening up all the fucking snails and eating them because she's a psycho. Yeah, I'm sorry I neglected you. Oh, Why did my heart. So yeah, this is one of my favorite Spongebob <laughs> episodes. And it's not all down and gloomy. It has a very nice ending and some of Patrick's best bits. Spongebob, what happened? This picture is crooked. 
Oh my gosh. Number eight, I remember that episode like berries. it's yesterday. Rebecca dies. In this episode, a young Nigel befriends an elephant named Rebecca and also saves her from the hunters. Oh Years later, my. Eliza tries to find the same elephant to see if she remembers her father Nigel, since elephants seemingly never forget. Smashing. Oh. Smashing. The two become friends and manage to save Rebecca's daughter Zita from a mud hole. The real sadness is towards the end of the episode, when a tired Rebecca dies in front of Eliza and her dad. <laughs> Oh my god. Please, Rebecca, don't go. <laughs> that is depressing because she was so likable, having known her for just one episode. And it's even worse seeing Eliza trying to deny the inevitable. Bro, that was always the worst thing. Why the hell were companies doing that, bro? Why were they, they were purposefully traumatizing children from a young age, bro. Like, they always took the most likable, the most lovable, the most enjoyable character in an entire show or movie, and they just kill them for no reason. And then they sit there and they slowly die as they slowly start to slip away into the heavens, bro. And the main characters is always sitting there crying. It happens every time, bro. I don't know why they, they always kill off the most likable character. Can somebody please drop an episode of something where you take the most hated character and push him off a cliff? Because this, this, is, this is getting too much, bro. This, this is why I've got fighting demons, bro. This is stuff like this. Number seven, the ending to Dinosaurs. This was one of the most terrifying fucking shows. I've, I refuse to watch this. I refuse to watch this fucking show, bro. It te terrified me when I was a kid. I'm gonna be honest. I try not to put that many finales on this list because, well, of course it's going to be sad. Most of the time, it's sad because the show's ending, not because the finale itself is actually sad. But this is the most soul-crushing yeah, ending ever. I've never watched this. This, I was too... And yes, it was on ABC, but look at it. Whose parents wouldn't show their child this? In the final episode, the migration of the bunch beetles is delayed causing the vines or cider poppies to overgrow. Earl, the family dad, sprays massive amounts of defoliant that ends up wiping out all plant life. So, in a desperate act to revive all the plants, Richfield figures that it needs to rain again and that rain comes from clouds. So he plans on throwing a bunch of bombs into volcanoes so that they would erupt causing more what? clouds. However, instead of rain clouds, smoke clouds form, causing a global cooling that scientists say will take tens of thousands of years before the sun can melt away any of the snow. Well, little guy, what happened was daddy was put in charge of the world and he didn't take real good care of it. And now it looks like there won't be much of a world left for you or your brother and sister to live in. Are we gonna move? So yeah, so Papa here caused the extinction of the dinosaurs because he sprayed some fucking pesticide. Nice, dude. He, he sprayed some pesticides, killed all the plants, and caused an Armageddon throwing bombs into volcanoes, creating smoke clouds. Nice, man. Are we gonna move? Well, no. There's no place to move to. This is the only world we got. What's gonna happen to us? You all dead. As the camera zooms out and the sound of wind grows, the family prepares for their final night together. Number six, Sesame Street, Mr. Hooper. Sesame Street. When actor Will Lee died in 1982 due to a heart attack, oh? the producers of Sesame Street were left confused over how to deal with his death in the show. His role as Mr. Hooper was so beloved by children that certainly they would notice Mr. his Hooper sudden is. disappearance. Therefore, ignoring it was out of the question. After consulting with some child psychologists, the head writer of the show, Norman Stiles, prepared a script designed to deal with the issue of death towards kids. Lee's cause of death was not mentioned, but the episode took a very honest and direct approach. Towards the end, Big Bird meets up with his adult friends to show them his drawings of each of them. He finally presents his drawing of Mr. Hooper and asks, where is he? So that he can give it to him. Oh. Um, where is he? Big Bird, uh, don't you remember we told you? Uh, Mr. Hooper died. He he's dead. 
Oh, yeah. I remember. Well, I'll give it to him when he comes back. Big Bird. Mr. Hooper's Damn. not coming back. Why not? Because he dead, Big Bird, you big idiot. When, when people die, they don't come back. Ever? No, never. Why not? Well, Big Bird, they, they're dead. They they can't come back. Well, she's gonna come back. Despite the adult's efforts to explain death to Big Bird, he's still confused, sad, and even in denial, which is really heart-clenching. Well, I don't understand. You know, everything was just fine. Why does it have to be this way? Give me one good reason. Number five, Courage's parents. What? We all know this show is known for its dark. What? Wait, what? Dude, I don't like this. Nah, bro, this is, this is, uh, dude. Dude, nah, bro, I don't, why am I just now, I'm just now into hearing about this episode of Courage's Parents. I've never, nah, bro, I don't like where this is going. No, I don't, I, please don't do this to me. For humor and themes. And that's why it was as popular. That was the most terrifying fucking thing I've ever seen in my entire life. When I first seen that episode, I had nightmares for a week. Dude, I wet the bed. I'm, I'm not even, I wet the bed, bro. I was so as it was. I turned like, my shit to a really, swimming pool. Really, this got past the that's awesome. But even Courage had more sadder times in a few episodes. Actually, way more than you might think. In this episode, we learn about Courage's backstory and how he ended up with Muriel and Eustace. It turns out that when Courage was a small pup, his parents were kidnapped by a vet. Oh, into yeah! The rocket. Oh, yeah, now I remember! Oh, yeah, dude, this is fucked. Oh, oh, no, nah, bro. Courage was a small pup. You His bringing me back down this road? They're stuffed into a rocket ship, to which Courage tries desperately to break them out, before being chased by the same vet. Courage manages to escape, but at the cost of his parents, now soaring into space. In present day, the same vet traps Muriel and Eustace. Yeah. Only this time, Courage does manage to save them. And that's it. That's the episode. Dude. We see a young Muriel adopting Courage. We even see that his parents are still on some planet, but that's how the episode ends. And it's really sad. Just for Courage's that, parents bro. to be robbed yeah. like that by a sadistic vet? Really depressing for a kid's show. Bro, these all, all of these are the same thing. Either somebody dies or somebody becomes an orphan, bro. Like, this is, is that really the only way that they can get children to cry? Is to either kill somebody or make the child an orphan, bro? This is... Number four. Like, Jesus. Avatar. The Tales of Ba Sing Se. Oh, yeah, bro. This episode is a collection of mini episodes detailing the adventures of each main character in Ba Sing Se. It's all good fun, not one of the more heavier episodes. Except for the tale of Iroh. Mm -hmm. In this episode, Iroh visits the market, helps some kids, almost gets mugged, and then gets to know the mugger. But in the but end, Iroh alone. goes up a hill, sets up some incenses, and sings a song titled leaves to the vine in memory of a son who he lost during the siege of Ba Sing Se. The episode is even sadder when this pops up. That's mm. right. Arrow's voice actor, the beloved Mako, passed away before this episode aired. What? I say beloved because... What? I didn't know that! Nah, dude, that just makes it worse. Nah, that just, that just makes... I didn't know that, dude. I didn't know that! The beloved Mako passed away before this episode I aired. I didn't know who Mako was! Nice! I say beloved because, yeah, a lot of people admired his talent and even grew up with his work. And this segment was dedicated to him. Dude, that's so fucking sad, bro. Because Iroh, Iroh is one of the most likable characters in cartoon history, bro. Like, like you, you watch, you watch Avatar, and you, you can't help but to just love Uncle Iroh, bro. Like he does nothing. He, he drains. He's got his words of wisdom, bro. He's super smart. He's nice. He's kind. He's loving. He, he doesn't fight anybody. He's not a villain. He's not a menace, bro. He just, he just, he just sips tea and makes sure Zuko's not being an idiot. 
And that's really it. You know what I mean? Like, he's, he's just kicking it, doing his own fucking thing, bro. His, his, his son dies, so he has no will to be a fire, a fire nation general anymore. So he's just kicking it, doing his own thing, bro. And you can't help but to love Uncle Iroh. And now I'm finding out that that was dedicated to the voice actor. Dude, nice. Nice. I'm Number sad. Three. Hey, Arnold. Rewatching Hey, Arnold. I found that it was a much more darker show than others on Nickelodeon. The show wasn't afraid to tackle more heavier tones. In the episode Helga on the Couch, Helga begins to talk to a school psychologist, and we begin to learn more about her. Like most bullies, her home life really sucks. Daddy, who's gonna take me to play school? Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, who's taking me to play school? Yeah, yeah, in a minute, Olga. No, I'm Helga, Dad. Helga. She was not only alone, but ignored by her parents. She was also bullied in school for having a crush on Arnold, the only guy who was really ever nice to her. We learned that he trusts them more than humans, but Arnold takes him out to show that some people can be trusted. However, while they're away, Arnold's bullies come along and trash the place, causing the Pigeon Man to reveal one saddest moment has to be in Arnold's Christmas. In this episode, Arnold has to give a present to Mr. Huynh, since he's his secret Santa. But Arnold wonders why Mr. Huynh's always so sad this time of the year. This is where we learn about Mr. Huynh's daughter, and how he gave her up during the Vietnam War so that she can have a better life. Damn. Number two, Rugrats, Mother's Day. Oh, In this stop! 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 You are not gonna, you're not gonna start slapping me in the face with this Chucky's mom shit. No, 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 bro. The movie, the fucking the the, the movie. Oh my god! Stop, bro. Stop, dude. This is you taking it too far. They're trying to make me cry right here, right now. The grown man trying to make me cry in front of a bunch of people. Stop. Stop. Number two. Rugrats. Mother's Day. Dude! In this episode, the babies and even the parents celebrate Mother's Day. Angelica is building a macaroni statue, Stu builds a breakfast and bed machine, and so on. But Chucky's dad is worried that his son will stumble across a box containing his mother's belongings. Oh my god. He tells Dee Dee to take care of it for him so that Chucky won't find it and start wondering about his mom. Throughout the episode, the babies try to find Chucky a new mom, even making Angelica his mom at one point. Chucky's not saddened by the fact that he doesn't have a mom, he's just used to it. He inevitably finds the box containing old pictures of his mom and her other stuff. This is where Chucky finally gets to learn about her and what happened, which is pretty sad. Oh my gosh. This topic would be later expanded on in Rugrats in Paris. Yes, this! Yes! Yes, when they meet the fucking Asian girl for the first time? Dude, yes, this is what I was talking about. Even sadder. Oh my god. Number one. One, how do you top that? How do you, Mr. Rod, that's how you do it. Mr. Now, Rogers nice. says goodbye. Nice. The final episode of the beloved show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, premiered on August 31st, 2001. PBS announced the show's end due to Rogers being diagnosed with stomach cancer yeah, and bro. wanting to retire. Rest in but fucking Ro peace, bro. Rest in peace to a legend, dude. He's oh my gosh. He promised that he would still try to teach children through his website. And at the end of the final episode... Bro, one of the three... One of the, one of the big three, bro. The three-headed dragon of childhood white dudes, bro. Mr. Rogers, Bob Ross... And Steve Irwin, bro, rest in peace to all of them, dude. This is Rogers promised viewers, this just is hard, as he does at the end of every show, that he will be back. And while the episode is punctuated not. with a depressing undertone of Rogers' illness, the real tearjerker is his goodbye speech announcing his retirement. I'm just so proud of all of you who have grown up with us. And I know how tough it is some days to look with hope and confidence on the months and years ahead. Mr. Rogers, it's not a, man a who wonderful simply day wants in the neighborhood. The a place. It's a very, He'll very bad be day. Our neighbor. But I would like to tell you what I often told you when you were much younger. 
I like you just the way you are. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Oh my gosh, bro. That was, that was rough. That was, that was rough and tough, bro. The first half, the first half wasn't too bad, right? Because there's, there's a lot of shows in there that I didn't watch. I never heard of and stuff, you know what I'm saying? So it didn't really hit me, right? But it said, once we started getting into the second half, right? When we started doing the shows that I knew, right? Courage, Rugrats, that fucking Spongebob episode. That's, that's the saddest Spongebob episode ever, right? Um, the, the um, <clears throat> my heart, yeah, bro. Woo-wee, bro. The Pokemon, dude, they all, they all hit differently, bro. And it's just like, like, it's, it's, it's bringing it all back, bro. Because I remember watching some of those for the first time. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, the, the Butterfree with Pokemon, I didn't, I don't remember that specifically, but I remember the Pokemon movie and the first time I felt when I first watched that. I remember what I felt like the first time I watched that episode where Gary dips out. I remember the first time I watched that Rugrats movie, bro. I, rem I remember that I was filled with nothing but sadness and despair. And I'm sitting here, however many years later, as a grown-ass man, reliving my childhood trauma, bro. I'm, I'm now sad and despaired at this very moment, dude. Because that, that video just brought back so much shit. That I just completely forgot it, dude. Oh my, I'm sad. I'm gonna end up. I'm done. When I'm done, I'm cry. I'm gonna curl up in the corner of my room with a bottle of Jack, and I'm crying my eyeballs out until I black out for 12 hours, bro. Because that was, oh my gosh, that hit me, bro.